Unites in the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We're also rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. Welcome to the third hour of the show today. It's Country and Western Tuesday. I hope that you like the uh, music. Also, check out my brand new column on uh, warnetdaily.com, WND.com. Ugly Truth Behind Missing D.C. Black Girls. Fake news. It's a fake news story. And you have these black celebrities claiming that 14 black girls went missing in one night. And that this is racism and sexism. That black girls don't get as much attention from police and media. But the girls were not missing. They ran away. They ran away from their mothers, black mothers and black grandmothers because of the way that they're being raised without love, without patience. So check it out. Go to WND.com. I have in-studio guests today, this hour. I have with me, let me find it here. He's somewhere here. (laughs) (laughs) Michael A. Woods Jr. in studio a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, retired Baltimore police sergeant, activist for police reform, and civilian, civilian, civilian-led police model, and founder of Veterans Stand. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Jesse. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. And there's no S on the end of my name that is a common mistake, and I just want to make sure that, oh, that everybody knows yeah. that, because everybody will say Woods. It's like, it's they Wood. Do, it's yeah. Wood. <laughs> Michael Wood. And even though he doesn't have an S, I still say it Woods. <laughs> I, my brother-in-law last name is Wood, and everybody call him Woods. Yeah. I wonder why that is. I have no idea. Well, how old are you? 37. Oh, you look younger. Yeah, I've I, I take that. I, hopefully, when I'm 57, you'll still be saying that. <laughs> and so, are you a white guy? Uh, I mean, I'm mixed races, but majority white. What do you mix with? Uh, all, all over. I, I mean, it's we're we're getting to the point where eventually we're going to be mutts. Oh so, man, uh, that's I'm, terrible. That, <laughs> well, that's what we are. <laughs> we're all just mixed together anyway. That's so it awful. Matter. No wonder we are so weak as human beings. Why? Because when you mix it, mutts it are weak, stronger. It weaken it. Ah, that, that's 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 why true. they call it mutt. Well, mutts are healthier, but I won't get into that <laughs> argument. Yeah. That's I mean, every, you, genetic diversity makes you healthier. So, oh, you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Oh man. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to talk to you about the relationship between blacks and police, and the government. Uh, so let's just get this out. At one time, you were a police officer. Right. I spent 11 years in the Baltimore Police Department from 2003 to 2014, where I was a street patrol officer, a foot patrol officer. I was a narcotics detective, a major case detective, a sergeant, a commander of units. That's major. So. And what was it like working there as a, all that? I, I mean, that's, that's a little broad to think of what it's like. But I, I went in there with a an, an attitude to have fun and do the adrenaline seeking aspect of what police are, are in your media of what you want to be. Right. And so I thought I was going to do good work and, and help out a community, but also get some thrills and enjoyment out of <laughs> it along right. the way. I mean, I was a Marine. That's what I came from. That's right. But uh, the overall experience, I would say, was kind of like looking behind the curtain. It, it was the biggest takeaway that I had is seeing what the actual applications are, where we are, what we're doing in policing, and kind of how that results, how how our biases and prejudices influence the system of what policing is. So did you grow up thinking one day I'm going to become a police officer? Yeah, absolutely. What inspired you to want to become a police officer? I wish I could attribute it to something grandiose, but I'm pretty sure it's just watching uh, cops on TV and yeah. seeing them run around and being glorified. I mean, we have a society that glorifies police and military. So uh, if you don't have a way out and you need to get somewhere, what poor? I was poor. So what we do in this country is poor people can get 
some bump by joining the military. Yeah. So I joined the Marine Corps at 17, where I was trained to kill people in exchange for a college education. Right. And then I took that skill set, the only skill set I really had at that time, to the police department, where I was essentially trained to do execute the new Jim Crow in our systems. Amazing. Did you like doing that? I, I, until I realized what I was doing. Um, so you feel like you're doing good because... Society says that you should be doing these things, that you should be, the, that, that it's protection, that you're helping. And I, I think we, we did have those kind of ideas maybe somewhere in, in society, but that's not what the system of policing actually is. So once you realize what you're doing, you simply cannot enjoy it anymore. So you got to a point as an officer that where you believed that you were not helping people dramatically got to that point. Um, I saw in the end of the department is where I first had problems, the unprofessionalism of what policing is. Um, you, you, as, as somebody uh, that pays taxes and runs a lifestyle, you want to call on the police to have them serve your needs. And it, but they don't do that. They're not even incentivized to do that. They're incentivized to do the needs of politicians and, and few elite members of society. And then those few politicians and elite members of society we know are funded and, and their campaigns are driven by corporate donations. And that's what really controls our political scenes. And then that's what controls your police. Are you a liberal? No, I mean, my, I, I would shed those, uh, any of those labels. I, I, I think those labels were created and are part of our society in order to divide us, to make people think that we're on different teams, and we're simply not on different teams. I think the far right and the far left are the exact same thing, and I think the whole paradigm of, of politics and that there are these two things and these two labels are what make us not get along. When you vote, do you tend to vote con for the uh, conservative or liberal, or de Democrats or Republicans? Um, I, I would vary. So I voted for Mitt Romney and I voted for Jill Stein. Did you, Jill Stein? Yes. Did you vote for President Trump? No. You did not? I voted for Jill Stein this, this election. Oh, this is? She's right. right. Yeah, okay. Oh, Jill, yeah. Amazing. Uh, why not President Trump? Um, I, I don't believe he's a moral character, and I don't believe that, uh, that Hillary Clinton is a moral character, and I'm into disrupting that system. Those are, those are two individuals to me who are still playing that game, that game of politics, of, of divisiveness, of... Uh, of being controlled by money interest and not what the people's interest actually are. And you believe Jill Stein is better than Trump? I, I, I believe she's better than Trump. I mean, but I don't, I, I just simply don't care about this. This, this is all relatively irrelevant to my work and what I do. I don't care who's in charge. I stand against who's in charge and telling you how you should behave. I want you to be a free-thinking individual that can come up with arguments that we can have back and forth. And I don't want you wearing a black label, and I don't want you wearing a, a, a label of, of liberal or conservative. I want to look at you as Jesse Peterson. But I and am, I, I won't accept it. I simply won't accept the labels or the division. But I am a black conservative. I'm a black Christian conservative Republican. You're free to define yourself that way. Hold the 100 to the core. Right, and I'm free, and to, I'm so I'm free for, to shed those labels, though. I'm so far right that I made the alt-right look good. Well, I, I mean, I doubt you're a Nazi, but okay. <laughs> Might be. Well, that's far right. So far right is Nazism. Far left is Jesus. <laughs> Just remember that. And speaking of Jesus, are you a Christian? I, I'm not a Christian, no. You're not a Christian? No. And do you, uh, what are you? When uh, it I'm comes to religion, I, how I'm do you? I'm an atheist. You're an atheist? Yes. Meaning what? I don't believe in any of these labels. I don't believe in any of these paradigms. You don't believe Jesus exists? I, I mean, no, I don't believe Jesus existed. I don't believe you can have evidence for Jesus existing. If, uh, but that's, that's, that, that doesn't matter. Like, that's focusing have you always on the felt, past. Have you always felt that way? Uh, with Jesus? Yeah, about the Christian thing. And no, Jesus. no, I went to church. I, I, grew, I went to a, uh, I was an altar boy at a, at a St. Stephen's Middle School. I listened, I've read the Bible, I've listened to other religions, I try to understand people. So at one point you were a Christian? Uh, no, I would never accept that label. You were raised you, that you, You're having a hard time understanding that I won't accept labels, aren't you? But if you went, to, if you grew up in the church, at that time you accepted it, you thought that you were a Christian, right? No, I'm a free-thinking individual, I, I'm not going to buy into those paradigms, so if somebody's trying to teach me something, I'm listening, but if I hear evidence to the counter, I'm going to change. So as a kid, you rejected what you were hearing in the, 
in the churches? I reject anything that is definitive that can't have evidence supporting it. So when you say you don't believe that Jesus is real, what I want you to do is present me evidence of Jesus' life that is, that is testable and provable. I subscribe to the scientific method. I'm doing my dissertation on my PhD. I care about what is true. I don't care about what these labels are. And so you don't believe there's a heaven or hell then? No, of course. I don't believe any of these things. Okay. So my question to you is going to be, what evidence do you have that there would be a heaven? If you wouldn't give it to me, that's cool. But to like have a 30-minute discussion on conjectures, let's, let's talk about something meaningful. Uh, I just need to get you on record, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, I, um, you say that the police is there to um, serve our needs. Is that right? Did you say that? Well, no, I, I'm saying that that's what you would— Imagine that's what we kind of think that policing are is that police are there to protect and serve us, right? Uh, so, do you disagree with that as I a do. philosophy? So, well, who, I, I who know do you think they're there to protect? I, us? They're there to protect and serve, but not my needs. They're there to keep me from the bad folks, protect me from the bad people. Okay, so that's how you want to define policing, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so to you, you do would you prefer... disagree with that? No, no, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. We can have arguments, but what I'm trying to say is that. Policing should be defined by its citizenry that interacts with it, its stakeholders, not by the cop. So by coming and, yelling and, and, and talking to me about what I think some policing should be, that should just be a suggestion. It should but really— But that doesn't make sense because it's clear that you, the police is there to protect the good from the bad. You're saying that's clear, but their empirical evidence isn't that that's that their outcomes are because— when we sit there and you will sit there and you will say something about crime being bad in a neighborhood as a citizen and if the police are supposed to protect you then you need to ask what should they be doing in order to protect you arrest kill get them out of the way we know that those three things <laughs> empirically don't reduce crime so those things actually sow the seeds that's of not true crime. that they don't reduce crime that is not true well, we can go over it that not being taken right, we're giving our music to right we're getting now. our music to play out so do we hit that <laughs> after the break we do okay let's hit it after the break then. all right back in a moment folks So I say that the job of the police is to protect uh, and serve, me to uphold the law. We don't need them for anything else other than that. And you say? Well, what I'm trying to say and what we had the argue, this discussion, the disagreement on is what causes crime, right? So you're claiming that it's something. So I would like to hear what your claim is of what causes crime. Well, first, I want to just get it clear. It's not the police responsibility to figure out what causes crime. It's their job to come in and protect us from the criminals, the good from the criminals. Is that clear? Right. But so how would you protect you from the criminals? So what you're arguing for and what modern policing does is say someone robs a bank and then the police go in and they try to figure out the details of how the robbery took place. Right. And then they put that person into a prison cell and punish them. That's, right. that's our modern policing system. But what happens if that whole system, that whole punishment and whole marginalization and not being able to be trained and pushed out into society actually makes that person more likely to commit a robbery when they're released from prison? So what we should be doing is when you want someone, if someone robs a bank, you don't want to be robbed into the bank the next time, right? So does it matter to you if every person that comes in here and shoots your producer goes to jail? Or does it matter that people come in here and don't shoot your producer? Well, it matters that everyone who comes in and shoot uh, James, who is the producer, go to jail. The problem with going to jail today, going to jail is like going on a vacation. It, they're not punishing the criminals. They should put them on, back on the roads and make them fix roads and give them bread and water like they did in the good old days when, when uh, boys were boys and men were men. And when they get out, believe me, they are less likely to commit a crime again. The, the that, that, Jesse, system Jesse, is not Jesse, set up. Jesse, I have to the interrupt you. The judicial system You're is making... not set right. up to mama someone. They're not set up to treat you like you're a good person. 
is set up to punish you for committing crimes so that you are less likely to do it again. But it's all soft now, like going home to mama. Okay, so you're making a lot of claims. So your first claim that you have made, just in that statement there, was that if someone is punished, they're less likely to commit a crime. Yes. So is that true? Yes. How can you prove that? Because in the good old days when they punished folks for committing crimes, most of the time they didn't return because they did not commit the crime again. Now they do. They are more likely to return now because the judicial system is so weak because they have listened to the liberals and the children of the lie to now they're soften the punishment. So the people are just coming out, committing the crime, and they go right back because it's, they know it's no big deal. And it's so bad that the fallen Messiah, Barack Obama, let them out even before they commit, they, com they finish their time do, in do you, jail. Do you know what it means when people say word salad? Word what? Word salad. I'm sorry? A word salad. Right. So you're speaking in word salads. So what, you're, what is that? you're throwing a lot of claims at once that you're not proving. And then when you throw all those claims at once, it takes somebody trying to discuss with you. It takes them hours and hours to undo all those claims that you threw in there. Well, isn't it true why, that people why, are going I'm a guest. In, I'm a guest on your show, Jesse. Let me talk. Isn't it true that people are going in and out of jail like it's nothing nowadays? No, that's absolutely not true. No. Khalif Browder who ended up committing suicide from all of his torture that he spent in three years in Rikers Island being held in solitary confinement and being abused by prison guards on a daily basis and getting in fights in that jail and not being kept safe. He ended up committing suicide and did never even committed a crime because that's what our criminal justice system looks like. You are supposed to be asking a criminal justice expert and somebody that's in the system what it's like. The audacity of you to tell me what it is is beyond reprehensible. Were you traumatized as a police officer? Because what you're saying doesn't make any sense what? at all. You brought up one case of whom no one else knows about, and you're using it as an example. Can you type of in what? your computer, Khalif Browder, I mean, and see I don't how care many about incidences Khalif, there are? I don't care about who, whomever that is. Yeah, the problem is it's that you don't proven, care about Khalif not, Browder. It's not proven my point. The problem though. is you don't care it's about Khalif proven, Browder. Bring up one incident is not proven the overall problem. No, no. See, here's how things work. Like, see, this is gravity, right? So this is gravity over and over. And I keep doing it. And we hold that as a truth only until as a, as, as a truth that may maybe we don't we don't drop it and it stops. If at one point in time at ever I go, someone drops a pen and it doesn't hit the ground, the theory of gravity is out the water. So when you come up with any claim that says this happens and I throw one thing that throws that theory out, your theory's out the water. That's how it works. If you tell me that every person that wears blue shoes wears blue shoes and I go outside and we see somebody wearing red shoes, well, then you're just wrong. It's ridiculous to bring up one example to try to prove an overall point. I'm not proving. In I'm in disproving a, your claim. In a given situation— you're going to always have something that goes wrong, but that doesn't make the whole situation bad or wrong. Let me ask you, you this. You can't make you a claim, Jesse. You mentioned Jim Crow early in the introduction here. What did you say about Jim Crow? We're, I'm not going to talk about Jim Crow because— but you mentioned it when, in association with the police department. Right. I'm not going to talk about anything until we talk about your actual claims. I'm not going to allow you to continue to throw— claims and word salads at me and change the subjects. You claim— You can't run the show. You're here to answer questions. Okay. So you claim that crime was You do realize that, right? You claim that crime was caused by a certain amount of things, right? Yes. Okay. So if you want police, we were talking about here that we, you want your producer, you don't want your producer to come in and get shot. Is that true or false? Right. Okay. So you don't want him to get shot. But if he does, make that person suffer for it in jail or in prison. I don't want him to have a vacation. Right. That's fine. So- the next, which you, so what if somebody comes in tomorrow and shoots him again or shoots your new producer? What did you do by putting that first guy in jail that would prevent the next guy from coming in and shooting your next producer? I, I, that's a ridiculous question because that's not going to happen, first of all, and that's not what we're talking about. It's when, exactly the, what the we're talking about. The point we are making, if you commit the crime, you need to do the time. It's just simple as that. No, the point that you said was that police, you want the police to keep you safe. 
That's the point, which we haven't gotten past yet. Right. Okay, so I'm trying... That's perfect on the police. Okay, so I'm a policing expert. You're a talk show host. So if you would like to talk about what policing is and how police keep, can keep you safe and what the evidence for that is, then we can discuss those things. But let's not move on. Let's discuss those things. But you are... First of all, it sounds like you're trying to direct the way I do the show here. No, I'm trying you to talk. You telling me that. I'm trying to talk about your claim, which was to how we should police. What? And that you want to. So if you would let me what finish. What point you're trying to make? I will finish my points when you let me speak. Go ahead. Okay. So in order to keep you safe. I'm telling you that what we have to do to keep you and your producers safe is to figure out why crimes happen, the motivations behind them, to prevent them from occurring again. Otherwise, I haven't done anything. If all I do is lock up people and punish them and then put them into a prison cell, I have done nothing to keep you safe. Hold on. I, what I've actually done is put you into a prison system that we empirically, in the science, if you make a claim that punishment reduces crime, or, then you need to back that up. What I'm telling you is that the evidence, all the scientific literature, everything we know about policing is that punishment and deterrence do, and laws do not prevent crimes from occurring again in the future. So if we continue to think about punishing people and not training and not actually solving the problems, then we will never be able to to keep you safe. So the idea that punishment equals safety is the false paradigm. And now when you but also not hold on. That's not, honest, that's not true what you're saying. You're you need to prove that. That's not true. You need to prove that. We Prior to liberals taking over and softening the punishment and then tying Jesse, the hands I heard you say that and that's not true. We li- tied the hands of the police no, department. No, it's false. Crime. False. When you don't know what the hands crime, of the police department are, Jesse. They, you don't know what tying those hands mean. Co- when they committed crime, they went to jail and they were punished. They left right, right into it's Jesse. Just a, Jesse, it's not the police department that responsibility just, to figure out well, why people commit crime. You can't curse on the radio either. This is the radio. Back in a moment, folks. All right, folks, welcome back. Check out a brand new episode coming up tomorrow on our TV show, The Fallen State. I interviewed a millennial who was not able to answer some questions that I asked of her. This uh, brand new episode coming up tomorrow. Here it is. We got to get it for you. In the meantime, we take it. Next time on The Fallen State. You believe that an illegal alien, they should have the right to vote. Are you saying that just to be clear? I'm saying through, I, th- I think that, firstly, I'd like to scratch that question. Like, I'm not really comfortable with that question. Is that something we can do? Can we scratch that? I don't really want to answer that question. You don't want to answer that? Mm-mm. And why not? <laughs> I have in studio, we got to get to your calls, all lines of field right now. I have Michael A. Wood, Jr., U.S. Marine. And um, he is a um, from Baltimore, living in L.A. now, an activist for police reform. And uh, how can people get to your website or however? Thanks. The best thing I would like to steer people to is our veteran stand work that we do, which is www.veterans-stand.org. And I'm not supposed to say the www, so I don't know why I did that, but <laughs> yeah. veterans-stand.org. <laughs> And uh, we're continuing operations to try and provide veterans with ways to continue to serve their communities after. You tweeted about police brutality a few years ago. Um, Did you snitch on the police when you were a police officer? No, but Jesse, we just had a conversation off the air that you were going to let me finish this claim about crime numbers, and you immediately started the show by changing the subject on me again. Finish that, and then answer that question, we'll take some calls. So when you say that crime was, like, the criminal justice system was stronger in the past and did something better in the past, has crime gone down or up since that time? Crime has gone up since that time. Crime has gone down, has trended down. Can, 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 Can we, like... Pull up crime stats 
in, in America? Like, so your audience can see them right now? Finish your point. We, we have had epic crime reductions. The city of New York is down to around 100 homicides per year at, at 8 million people. It used to be over 1,000. Okay, crime in America is at an epic low. It has never been lower, and the world is in a pe more peaceful period than it has ever been in its entire history. We live in the most peaceful and the less crime environment in world history. So you're making a claim that it was better before, and those methods, whatever you're arguing for, were empirically not working. Are you living in the USA? Yeah, obviously. We just you really that. believe that crime is going down? And this isn't a matter of beliefs. We can find out the truth about this. We, we, know, we know what crime rates are. So, let's so are you calling all the police agencies liars for the numbers they report? Crime might be, might be going down somewhat over the last couple of years. No, no. But when Jesse, people were Jesse, being, when Jesse, people were being not... punished for committing crimes, crime was at an all-time low. When they started to soften up on punishing criminals, crime went through the roof. And it's still going up, especially at the end of Obama's, the fall of Messiah administration. But let me ask, you, you tweeted about no, no, we're not, we're not, we're not moving past. I, I'm not moving past an issue when you're sitting here saying that crime has gone up in the United States. It has gone down dramatically. It has, it has trended down throughout its entire history. Crime is going down and has trended down since the day people stepped foot on this planet, put in, on, on America, put in colonization here. Crime has continually gone down. You must accept that. Let's do this. You can have that. Let's move to the next point. Okay, thank you. You mentioned Jim Crow and police policing together in the opening of this discussion. What did you mean by that? I said the new Jim Crow. What do you mean by that? So what happened, the reason why I think we have a lot of lingering issues that we don't kind of understand in our culture is that during the 60s, we kind of, we like understood how these things needed to be changed. We put in stuff like the Civil Rights Act and our culture kind of coalesced around this idea that you can't have this sign that says white and colored get different fountains, right? Right. But what we failed to do is during that time, we didn't codify our systems. So we didn't institutionalize that belief. And we left our police departments and our, our institutions of government to continue to operate under the premises of slavery and colonization. So what happened in policing, American policing is unique from policing anywhere else in the entire world because America formed in a unique way that's, that's different. And what policing does is calls out those three things. And that is the creation and maintenance of oppressed classes and then extraction, extracting resources from those oppressed classes in order to fund the oppression of those classes. So the way this starts is policing in, in Boston started with slave catching. You know that, right? This is so insane. It's, you said that, I mean, who are the oppressed classes? Right. So your oppressed classes right now would be lower income. They will be uh, black. They will be brown. They will be woman. They will be Muslim. So you have would different— Would they be white as well? Well, it, it depends on what system you're operating in. So, uh, Are there oppressed whites? Yeah, you just answered the question. Are there poor white people? No, oppressed right. white people. Poor— is an oppression. No. So are there poor but white people? But you left out white, so I'm asking, no. are they part of this oppressed people? Are white people poor? Just, are there poor white people? Why did you leave them out? I, I asked you, you left that, that group out, and, and I'm asking you, are they part of that group? Of course, there's poor white people, Jesse. So, pro so poor is a factor. So if you're poor... That's a factor. If you're poor and white, then that's one. But it's not white. So let me explain to you why white by a race isn't. Why? Okay. So colonization in America was done. And when you say white supremacy, it's because that's what is in power in the system of colonization. There have been other powers. So there was, there was brown power during the Ottoman Empire when you had brown supremacy. So at that point in time, would Brown have been a factor of oppression? No, of course not, because that was a system of Brown power, like Egyptians would have been somewhere else. Where is all this craziness coming? This doesn't even make sense. Where are you getting I know, this It doesn't from? make sense to you
Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you? But black people are not suffering uh, due to poverty. They're suffering due to the lack of moral character and the destruction of the family. Right. Black you, people that's are an, not. That's another word salad people, claim. I can't go into that. Black people are not poor with physical things. They're doing better than you are. Even the so-called poorest black person is doing better than you. And I. I'm assuming that you're working. That, that's patently but unfalse. That, you assume that I'm working and I don't receive a well, paycheck. Well, you might not. You're but throwing I'm just out saying, claim- my, my point is, poverty poverty is not oppression. Of course, the poverty is oppression. No, it is. Like, it's not true. I, I don't understand what you're saying. When you have a system of like, let's take regressive taxing. So, when the police go out and they give a thirty-five dollar ticket to somebody, right? What does a $35 ticket mean to somebody that's making $100 a week? A lot. It's 35% of their income. So a $35 ticket for somebody that's making a million dollars a year doesn't, make any, doesn't hurt them at all. So that's a form of oppression. When you have bail and you can't get bail. You know, it's really time out for making excuses for black people. I'm really sick of white people, white liberals. The only person that says white liberal or black in this is you, Kat. And black liberals and the, the children of the lie making up excuses for black people not standing up and, and being independent and doing their thing. I'm not doing that. That's what you're doing. I just said oppressed classes. A, this can all apply to white people. you black people into that. Black people... Is, Black people back in a moment. <laughs> All right, I'm getting to the calls and emails. I mean, everybody in the moment is uh, getting involved with this. Take your phone calls at 888-7753. Seven seven three. So let's get to a couple emails first here for you. Um, oh, you tweeted about police brutality a few years ago. Did you snitch when you thought police brutality was happening? Well, I don't know, Jesse. You just called me a fool for being educated. No, I said education, educated people are fools. Yeah, I'm an educated Especially person liberals. and an honorably I served— I didn't call you personally that. I'm an educated, educated person. People. That means if I said that all people wearing blue shirts are fools, that would include you at this moment. So when you said educated people are fools, yes. I want your audience to understand that I'm an re- honorably retired Marine Corps sergeant. Well, the audience didn't even hear me say that. It doesn't matter. You said it. Uh, okay, go ahead. So I'm an honorably retired police officer— an honorably served United States Marine Corps veteran, and I have an education that I've worked my ass off to get as a 37-year-old. And to have you insult me like that and the career that I've done to serve and protect this country, the people you're supposed to support, I think it really lays in to the identity politics and stuff that you play into and the ideology instead of being objectable. I'm supposed to be the people this country respects. Okay, so let's move on. Did you snitch on police when you thought while you were an officer, when you thought you saw police brutality? No. You did not. Um, I have an email question. Um, ask him if some people are evil. Uh, I mean, no, I, I don't. Like, you'd have to define evil. I don't know what that means. You don't know, have no idea what evil is. Uh, it's a really broad term. You'd have to define it. I think if you got a thousand people in a room, all thousand would define evil differently. So we need to define that term. How would you define evil? I don't believe it's an actual term, so I, I need oh, to know you what you Oh, you don't believe? Okay. Let's go to the phone calls. Let's go to Los Angeles and talk to the Bible. Go to God. Bible God, go to God. Good morning, sir. You're on with Michael. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Good morning, Michael. Um, Jesse, when I was in the Marine Corps, I came across the guilt trip liberal Marine, and uh, of which um, Michael Wood is one. And it's his education. You're spot on again. It is his education that has done that to him, because in today's educational system, they are oppressing, there's that word, they are oppressing students by lying to them and filling them with guilt. For instance, there is a guilt trip, like, lie going through the educational system that, you know, men oppress women and whites oppress blacks. And freedom-loving people are really oppressing the poor. You know, they're the rich and they oppress the poor. All that is just lies. And you're right. The, um, Michael Wood originally said, I mean, way back in the beginning, said that 
oh, prove that punishment stops crime. Well, I'll prove that punishment stops crime, if you like. If you pay people to commit crimes, pay them very, very well, the bigger crime they commit, the more money they make, will you have more crime? Absolutely. And if you burn your head on, in, by sticking in fire, and that's a punishment for doing a silly thing, you will not stick your hand back in there. Now, granted, there are some exceptions. People will stick their hand in a second time, but that doesn't mean that the punishment doesn't work for most people who are sane. You see, insane people go ahead and stick their hand back in there. <laughs> but most people, punishment works just like reward works. If you reward people for a certain behavior, you'll get more of that behavior. If you punish them, you'll get less of it for most people. Let's get a response because I want to get in as many folks as possible here. How do you respond, Michael? What am I responding to? I wasn't asked a question. Um, those are claims, again, which aren't going to be supported by any additional evidence. I mean, you're saying that students are oppressed with lies. Do you go to the plumber for liver surgery? There is liver surgeons who lie about how many liver surgeries you need. I mean, that's been proven. So I don't know what that point means. Would you go you to a plumber? To be educated in a certain way. Would you go to a plumber for liver surgery? Most education today. Would you go and to a plumber for will... liver surgery? No, you do not. Why? Because they're not educated in that. Okay. They don't. They're not properly Moving on. trained. Moving on. But now you have not been properly trained in sociology or in anything relating to relations between people. The universities, that's not their mission. Their mission is to indoctrinate in left-wing ideology. For instance, you said Nazism was the alt-right, when it is Nazism stood for, the word Nazi is a German an acronym, and that stood for socialism. And socialism is, an, is, is, a, is a beast of the left. Socialism is the left, and Nazism was socialism, so you're totally wrong in that. Nazi, you where your education Hitler was a conservative you? Christian. All right, thank you, Bob. We're going to go, i got to run. Um, another question, email. Uh, Planet of my own, man. How did policing start in Africa? A question for you, Michael. I have no idea. You have no idea. He has no idea. Let's go to... Uh, Greg out of New York. Let's see here. Greg, good morning, sir. You're on with Michael. How you doing, Michael? How you doing, brother? Hey, let me ask you a question. This one thing that I, I notice is that when uh, a person mentions their accomplishment, they actually feel like they deserve praise for it. <laughs> Why do you feel like you deserve praise for your accomplishment? Why I, do you think we have to acknowledge that? That's an excellent question. I haven't used it to praise myself. I have only used it to refute the claims that they have said. Like the previous caller just said, I don't have any experience in sociology. That's a claim. So if I say, wrong, I'm educated, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology, then that wouldn't be praising myself. That would just be refuting the point, which is what I did here. When you say educated or people are fools, I'm saying, hey, you're calling me a fool. If you say you're not, I go, but I'm educated. It's not praising. When you say you're a police officer and a military vet, what does that mean? What does it actually mean for us as a general public? We owe you something? No, it doesn't. If you don't feel like you owe me you something for that? having served this country for 15 years, then you don't have to. I'm not, I don't put that burden on you. But we as taxpayers serve this country when we pay your salary. I pay when taxes, When we pay the too. military debt. So what right. do you owe us? Well, I pay taxes and I owe you the service that I promised to do, which is what I'm continuing to doing by trying to have this conversation. Well, it's mutual, well, it's mutual benefit then. So quit using that. Quit, I don't like when people use their accomplishments or how they serve the country as a means that us as citizens have to how, you know, we owe them a, a debt of gratitude. I, you know, I didn't do that. But you went, Mike, you went to the military because you had no other option, according, according to you, right? That's why most people so do So you didn't freely go to and serve your country. You had no other choice. It's almost like poor was in a form of oppression. Most people don't go to the military because right. they don't have any other Thank choice. You. Thank you for making my, my claim and my point that poor is a form of oppression, and that's why I had to go... So, uh, Michael, you claim that 
uh, this person asked about how did police start in Africa, began in Africa. It was because you claim that, let's see what they just said. You claim policing is founded to catch slaves. And that's why the question was, how did it, how did police start, policing start in Africa if it's founded to catch slaves? And it's hard for me to believe that a human being would think that way, but go ahead. Right. So when you talk about Africa, the colonization of Africa and the policing that was done there is rooted straight from British col colonies. And the British colonies ap applied uh, Peelian principles, which is Sir Robert uh, Peel from England. He, de he designed policing there. And it comes from a much more community policing oriented philosophy. So if I have to guess, uh, it's, it's going to be that their policing is more the British model because that's who brought policing give me into a, Africa. Give me a quick yes or no. You are white and you were a police officer in, uh, at one point. Were you brutal? Or did you commit brutality toward black people? No, I never crossed the line, and that's but that's you're one white, of my. Though. Why didn't you cross? I mean, what, being a white police officer, what prevented you from crossing the line? So I viewed policing as trying to be honorable. I tried to do it with honor. I tried to be colorblind. I tried to abide <laughs> by all the rules. So what really stood out to me, and I think why I have some credibility coming into this going forward is because of that, because my record is clean. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that even though I operate it with as, without malice and is with as much goodwill as I possibly could, our systems are institutionalized to have racist results. So it's not necessarily about, we, we shouldn't be focusing on the individuals because we can, I was, I can be somebody that acts without racism in my heart and in a racist institution. And then my outcomes are racist. So the point is to have systems and institutions which incentivize good behavior. So are most white people police officer like you? I, I, again, I, I can't, we can't keep going with these labels. Okay, I'm a human being, you're a human being. Whether I'm a white or black police officer, I should be acting the same way. And what's the answer to my question? What's are most white police officers like you in dealing with Minor oppress minorities. Minority. No, I mean I think it's clear that most police officers aren't like me, or they wouldn't be having we wouldn't be having this conversation. Amazing. Let's go to Lucan. Lucan, amazing? welcome to the show. You're all with Michael. Oh, okay. Real fast. I just, no, I just want to get to this question really quickly. Real fast. Let's say on the one hand you take Sasha Banks, Luke Luke Dunk's cousin, pro wrestling superstar, three-time WWE Women's Champion. And on the other side, uh, Lucan, you take I'm a so 43-year-old plumber. This is just an example. I'm listening to Lucan, kind of, hold on, hold on. I'm out of time. Will you come back? I'm, I'm here and I'm in LA. Okay, thank you. All right.